Let's begin uh, uh, Module 2. And the focus of Module 2 uh, is, is going to be uh, drugs and the human body, or quite simply drugs in the, drugs in the body. Uh, obviously, we're talking about people uh, using, these, uh, using these drugs. Um, just as a refresher from uh, Module 1 and uh, a little bit about DUI law, uh, you know, we indicated, I indicated that uh, people can be arrested for driving under the influence of any controlled substance, uh, and that includes alcohol, prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and uh, illegal drugs. <clears throat> so those four major categories of controlled substances uh, really present us with uh, a lot of different drugs that, that people uh, could have taken and subsequently drive and get arrested for driving under the uh, influence. So, uh, you know, theoretically, uh, we could talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, numerous drugs uh, and their effects on the body and the things that they do to the body. We could talk about, uh, obviously, alcohol. We could talk about marijuana, cocaine, uh, heroin, uh, but what I'd like to do in, in Module uh, 2 <clears throat> is really have a primary focus on uh, alcohol. <clears throat> and the reason uh, why I'm going to do that is that uh, the majority of people that get arrested for driving under the influence, um, <clears throat> their, their drug of choice uh, has been uh, alcohol. Um, alcohol is uh, highly integrated into uh, our society. Uh, it's part of our culture. Uh, I call it a uh, from the um, womb to the tomb drug. Uh, we celebrate births, deaths, and just about everything in between from my team won to my team lost to it's Monday, it's Thursday, it's over the hump day. Uh, we found ways to uh, integrate alcohol consumption <clears throat> uh, into the American lifestyle, into our individual lifestyles uh, in many ways. Um, the number of people getting arrested for driving under the influence of drugs other than alcohol <clears throat> and combination of alcohol and other drugs uh, has been increasing. and. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll come back to uh, some of these other drugs and uh, what I, what I want to do is uh, maybe really focus on uh, how using those drugs um, like marijuana, cocaine, or heroin, how they affect the driving skill. Uh, so we'll come back um, and talk a little bit more about drugs other than alcohol and, and try and relate it specifically to how using those drugs affects driving. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about uh, alcohol and uh, <clears throat> the type of alcohol that um, uh, we drink is ethyl alcohol, uh, also referred to as ethanol. Uh, <clears throat> alcohol is part of a uh, family of alcohols. There are other forms of alcohol. Uh, there's uh, methanol. Uh, wood grain alcohol. Uh, there's isopropanol, which is uh, rubbing alcohol. Um, <clears throat> these are all part of the alcohol family and, and, si and are similar um, in, their, uh, in their molecular structure. Um, but we don't drink isopropanol, well, hopefully you don't drink isopropanol uh, and methanol alcohol. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about why um, uh, obviously, we don't want to uh, be doing that. Uh, so, let's talk a little bit about uh, ethanol alcohol and uh, in, in understanding a little bit more about alcohol, I also want us uh, to, to get a broader understanding of what is blood alcohol concentration. Um, how does our blood alcohol concentration go up? And then how does the body remove alcohol uh, after we've established a blood alcohol concentration? Uh, when we're talking about um, alcohol in the body, it's very, very important 
<clears throat> to talk about uh, standard definition of a drink. Um, <clears throat> you know, when, when you're asked how much have you had to drink, uh, you usually answer that question with uh, some kind of numerical amount of drinks. Uh, I had one drink, I had two drinks, I had five drinks, uh, I had six drinks. <clears throat> So uh, it's important that we have uh, a standard definition of what really constitutes one drink. And on the slide uh, that, that you have uh, uh, with your uh, online version of the course, uh, you can see the definition of a drink. Uh, in terms of beer, it's uh, 12 ounces of beer. Uh, and that beer is usually at about 5% ethanol or ethyl alcohol. Uh, wine, uh, standard serving size, about five ounces. And most of the domestic wines that we drink um, <clears throat> are about 0.12 uh, alcohol content. And then uh, distilled alcohol, for example, whiskey, a standard drink size is 1.5 ounces and generally, uh, the distilled alcohol that we're drinking is about 40% ethanol uh, or 0.4%. So if we look at beer, standard domestic beer is about 5% alcohol per volume. What that means is if you had a, uh, a container of beer and it was 5% ethanol, that would mean that 5% of the liquid that's in that container is alcohol. Um, wine, again, at about 12%. So if you had a bottle of wine, for example, that was 12% uh, alcohol per volume, what that would mean is in that wine bottle, 12% of what's in that wine bottle uh, is pure ethanol alcohol. And with whiskey, you can see the concentration of alcohol in distilled drinks like whiskey uh, is much higher than beer or wine. Uh, the concentration of uh, alcohol in whiskey <clears throat> is actually 40%. So if you have a bottle of whiskey uh, that's 40%, that means that 40% of that bottle is ethanol. If you're drinking uh, uh, whiskey from a bottle and it indicates that the alcohol concentration is 50%, that means that half of that bottle is pure ethanol alcohol. Uh, if you're drinking um, rum 151 <laughs> or a, um, a high alcohol content um, uh, distilled beverage, you can get as high as 75 to 80% uh, of that content of that beverage is made up of ethanol. So uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that um, you're getting with, with the uh, distilled alcohol, you're getting uh, more pure ethanol with less amount of liquid. So uh, if we want to calculate how much alcohol is in a standard drink, what we need to do is multiply, and you can see the multi multiplication uh, on your chart there. We need to multiply uh, the total ounces of alcohol in the container by the percentage of alcohol. So <clears throat> standard beer is often 12 ounces at 5% concentration. So you've got 12 ounces of liquid, and 5% of that, 5% of that uh, 12 is pure ethanol. So if we want to convert this to how many ounces of ethanol is in this drink, what we do is we multiply uh, the total volume times the percentage of ethanol that makes up that drink. And you can see on your chart, uh, 12 times 0 0.05 uh, is a little over half an ounce of pure ethanol, or, or 0.6 ounces. 
Now, if we interesting, interestingly enough, if we go down and wine at uh, five ounces and 12% ethanol, uh, you multiply that together, and uh, that drink would have a little over half an ounce uh, of pure ethanol. Whiskey, again, we said has the highest concentration of ethanol, so you can get an equal amount of alcohol in a drink of whiskey by drinking actually less total volume liquid. So uh, one and a half ounces of whiskey times 40%, because 40% of that uh, beverage is made up of ethanol, that gives you a little over half an ounce uh, of alcohol. This is by definition uh, a standard drink. So <clears throat> if um, someone were to ask you, uh, how many drinks have you had? Um, if you, uh, when, when you did the uh, court reporting network evaluation, and uh, you probably remember they ask you, um, how many drinks do you usually drink and uh, how frequently do you drink? Uh, really what they were asking you, but not saying it, was how many standard drinks of alcohol uh, uh, did you have? So uh, by definition, uh, a standard drink of beer, a standard drink of wine, a standard drink of whiskey all contain the same amount of alcohol. So uh, interesting, uh, you know, I've heard people say, well, I couldn't have really been drunk or I really couldn't have been under the influence uh, because I was drinking beer. Well, <clears throat> the ethanol in beer, wine, and whiskey is exactly the same. It's the exact same uh, chemical. And um, if, you're, if you're talking about standard drinks, there's really no difference between the 12 ounces of beer, 5 ounces of wine, 1 and a half, uh, ounces of whiskey at the concentrations that are on that chart because all of them have just a little over a half an ounce of ethanol in them. Um, now, the, the, the reality is, and the, the challenge to this definition of standard drink, is that um, alcohol content of different types of beer, wine, uh, and distilled products can vary substantially. Uh, in terms of beer, microbrewers are, um, microbrewing uh, is becoming much more popular and uh, many times at microbreweries, uh, the concentration of ethanol in the beer is higher than 0 0.05. Um, could be 8% uh, ethanol per volume, 12% ethanol per volume, 15% um, ethanol per volume. Uh, and, you know, you don't always necessarily drink beer in a 12 ounce container. So, uh, you can drink a 16 ounce, uh, you can buy beer in a 40, uh, you can buy um, uh, uh, quart containers of, uh, of alcohol. So the important thing here is if you vary the number of ounces of the drink or if you vary the concentration of alcohol, you're going to increase the amount of total ounces of alcohol in the beverage. So if you're drinking a 16 ounce beer at 10% um, ethanol per volume, you're not drinking, you're no longer drinking a standard drink and you're no longer gonna be getting a half ounce dose of ethanol. Uh, so very, very, very important to understand when we talk about uh, blood alcohol concentration, and how many drinks it takes to influence your BAC and how much alcohol your liver can uh, break down and remove uh, from your bloodstream. When I talk about a drink, what I'm talking about is the standard definition of a drink or a little over half ounce uh, of, of uh, ethanol alcohol. Um, just to put this in the context of size container, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the slide that you have there in front of you, uh, you can see a 12 ounce beer, uh, <clears throat> or it's, yes, a 12 ounce beer, a five ounce glass of wine, 
uh, and a one half ounce glass of distilled alcohol uh, at the concentrations that we talked about. Beer at 5%, wine at 12%, distilled alcohol at 40%. So <clears throat> this is what a standard drink looks like. And again, if we did the calculation of total volume of liquid times the concentration of alcohol, we would find in that glass of beer, in that glass of wine, and in that small glass of uh, distilled alcohol, uh, there's equal amount of alcohol and it's a little over half an ounce. Uh, so when I talk about drink, when uh, we move further on in this module, uh, it's important uh, to understand I'm talking about a standard drink size or a little over half an ounce of pure ethanol in the drink. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about alcohol is that uh, it produces intoxication. And the root word of intoxication uh, is toxic. And uh, ethanol alcohol uh, is a toxic chemical uh, to the human body. Um, interestingly enough, though, um, ethanol alcohol or the alcohol that we drink is not real toxic in low amounts <clears throat> and in fact uh, if you drink alcohol in low amounts um, it produces a sense of euphoria <clears throat> or uh, this sense of feeling good and, and lightheartedness um, um, <clears throat> kind of sensation. Now if you continue to drink alcohol in high quantity in any given drinking experience or if you drink uh, uh, alcohol heavily over an extended period of time uh, you will experience the uh, toxic effects of alcohol. In the short term <clears throat> uh, the, most kind of, the most common uh, uh, toxic impact that we get from uh, drinking alcohol, drinking too much alcohol on a short occasion is uh, what we often refer to as a hangover. And so you have a, a headache, <clears throat> your stomach doesn't feel well, you might be vomiting. Uh, and this is because you've drunk enough alcohol uh, that some of the chemical properties of alcohol have caused a toxic effect in the short term. In the long term, if you continue to drink heavily, uh, alcohol can damage uh, literally every organ in your body. Uh, the liver, uh, the heart, uh, the brain. Um, but it's, an, it's, it's a very interesting drug in that uh, if you use the drug in very low amounts or if the drug is consumed, if, if ethanol is consumed in very low amounts, it, it does have this effect of uh, producing euphoria and feeling good. And, uh, that, that's why, basically why uh, people take drugs or start out taking drugs. Um, <clears throat> it's because when we take the drugs, uh, the, the drugs make us feel better. <clears throat> now, uh, later on uh, in Module 4, we'll be talking about another reason why uh, people uh, uh, take drugs, and that's addiction. Uh, <clears throat> and that's very different uh, than taking drugs uh, uh, to get the euphoric effect. Uh, so some things about alcohol in general. Uh, alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. Now what does that mean? <clears throat> that means that uh, when alcohol gets into our bloodstream and circulates around in, in our body and com com comes in contact with our brain cells, alcohol actually slows down brain cell activity. Um, it starts to literally put the brain to sleep from the outside in. And uh, many times people have the misconception that uh, alcohol is a stimulant drug. <clears throat> and that comes from observing people who have been drinking. And it's not uncommon uh, if you're at a party or, or out somewhere and uh, someone has been uh, consuming alcohol to 
uh, a fairly high blood alcohol concentration, you'll see them engage in behaviors that they uh, normally would not engage in. You know, they might sing, they might dance, um, they might start telling jokes, um, <clears throat> and you get the impression that the alcohol has stimulated them. But just the opposite of, is true. The reason why those behaviors are coming out is because alcohol has depressed the part of the brain that regulates inhibitions and decision making. So <clears throat> at a very low blood alcohol concentration, the part of the brain that controls and regulates inhibitions and decision making and reasoning is affected by alcohol. And when decision making goes down and inhibitions go down, behavior comes out that normally would not come out and it gives the impression that that individual has been uh, stimulated by the alcohol. So <clears throat> from one sense, I think we could probably say uh, behaviorally, in terms of their actions and their behavior, uh, the alcohol has uh, appeared to, to make them stimulated, but it's directly because the alcohol has reduced uh, the, the uh, functions that would control that behavior and keep it within more uh, regular social, social norms. Uh, <clears throat> another interesting thing about alcohol is uh, we don't digest it. Our digestive system um, really uh, doesn't alter alcohol uh, chemically and uh, enables us to use the alcohol or, or process the alcohol. Uh, alcohol requires no digestion. <clears throat> it actually gets in uh, to the body through a process of absorption, uh, which we'll talk about. And then <clears throat> alcohol will remain in the body uh, until it's actually broken down or metabolized. And the majority of that uh, process of removing alcohol from the bloodstream um, is a result of some enzymes that are produced by the liver. Uh, I'd like to continue with uh, our discussion about uh, some of alcohol's characteristics and uh, talk a little bit about uh, a few specific chemical properties that alcohol uh, has. And if you understand these chemical properties, uh, you'll have a good understanding of why alcohol does what it does to the human body when we drink it. Uh, <clears throat> the first property uh, that I think is important to identify is that alcohol is a solvent. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with other chemicals. Uh, gasoline, for example, uh, is a solvent. Um, solvents have some uh, very interesting properties and uh, one of the properties is they are able to dissolve uh, other chemicals. So if you have a, uh, a stain or a mark or you want to remove paint, uh, in order to dissolve that, uh, you'll use a solvent. Now, um, solvents in terms of the human body uh, are not necessarily good things. If you think about a solvent and dissolving something and then apply that to the human body, what solvents do to tissue and body cells is, is not literally dissolve them, but it damages tissue and it damages cells by producing inflammation. Um, the higher the concentration of alcohol in the beverage, the more likely it is that you're going to experience and sense the solvent property. So for example, uh, drinking a uh, beer with 5% ethanol <clears throat> is very, very different uh, than drinking a shot of Jack Daniels, which might be 40, 45, 50% ethanol per volume. So when, when you drink that shot of distilled alcohol, uh, the, the feeling or the sensation that you get is burning. Uh, and that's, that is the solvent property of alcohol. Um, in terms of the body, uh, if you continue to expose the body uh, uh, to higher concentrations of alcohol, uh, what you can actually do is cause uh, inflammation to the body tissue uh, and, to, and to body cells uh, over time. Uh, so for example, in the short term, if somebody is drinking um, uh, several shots 
of distilled alcohol. And um, <clears throat> they uh, feel a level of sickness. Uh, they, uh, they actually get sick, vomit, throw up. Um, <clears throat> what they've actually done is they've actually irritated uh, the esophagus and the stomach uh, uh, to the point where uh, the body is responding to, to being exposed to that solvent. And, and it's getting rid of the solvent, trying to get it out of the body. Now, if you've drunk enough alcohol to experience the, the, solvent, ex, the, the solvent effect on the gastrointestinal system, uh, you also uh, probably uh, know that it doesn't go away right away. So the um, um, uh, sensation of irritation, uh, high level of thirst, uh, continuing to vomit and throw up, uh, that's going to continue uh, until the inflammation uh, uh, from that uh, solvent property of alcohol goes away. Uh, if, you, if you continue to drink uh, high levels of alcohol over an extended period of time, uh, what you do is you <clears throat> expose body tissues and uh, body cells uh, to alcohol uh, chronically over time. And if you constantly irritate and cause inflammation, you're going you're gonna to cause damage to body organs and, and body uh, systems. So <clears throat> this is part of the process of how um, abusing alcohol and drinking alcohol heavily over a period of time uh, can result in liver damage and pancreas damage and damage to the kidneys and actual damage uh, uh, to the brain. <clears throat> Another aspect of, uh, or another uh, property of a solvent is that solvents are volatile. <clears throat> and uh, what that means is that they will evaporate on their own. So <clears throat> if they're exposed to the um, uh, environment uh, over a short period of time, uh, the solvent will <clears throat> uh, actually turn into a vapor or a gas uh, and evaporate. And this is true for alcohol also. Uh, alcohol will evaporate and turn into a gas. Uh, in fact, alcohol has a very low boiling point, uh, and the boiling point of alcohol is uh, much lower than the boiling point of uh, water. And uh, this is the um, uh, process, you know, uh, heating uh, alcohol to its boiling point and uh, bringing forth its volatility and causing it to turn into a vapor, um, you know that process as distillation of alcohol. And um, <clears throat> alcohol comes from fermentation and distillation. Uh, fermentation is simply the uh, uh, interaction of sugars and yeast and producing a byproduct, ethanol. Um, to get higher concentrations, of ethanol in beverages. It was discovered a long time ago uh, <clears throat> that you heat the ethanol, uh, uh, turn it into a gas form, and uh, gas obviously is lighter than liquid, and so the, the gas rises in the distillation process, and then you collect that gas in a container um, <clears throat> and allow that uh, gas to cool and turn back into a liquid state and then you capture that liquid and essentially what you've done is you've taken the ethanol out of solution so the ethanol now is much more highly concentrated and uh, that's how we get 90-95% uh, 99% um, uh, ethanol alcohol uh, per liquid through the process of distillation <clears throat> Uh, the volatility of uh, uh, alcohol is uh, also very important in terms of uh, breath testing for blood alcohol concentration. Because alcohol uh, gets absorbed into the bloodstream, <clears throat> it's, dis it's easily distributed throughout the body. <clears throat> and eventually al alcohol will pass through the lungs. And when it does that, some of the alcohol vapor that's produced from that alcohol gets trapped in these little air sacs at the base of our lungs. These little air sacs are called alveoli. 
And so you have alcohol vapor that's actually in the base of the lungs or, or deep within the lungs. And uh, over time, uh, the breath testing uh, device was developed. And what that breath testing device can do is uh, it can measure the concentration of alcohol that's in the air in these little air sacs in your lungs. And the way the, the machine is calibrated, the concentration of alcohol in the air in your lungs, deep down in your lungs, corresponds uh, exactly to the concentration of alcohol in your bloodstream. <clears throat> and uh, you may have uh, uh, taken a breath test, you may have had a blood test as part of your, uh, uh, your DUI arrest, but um, <clears throat> if you if you ever take a breath test, you'll notice that uh, you can't just activate the machine with a, you know, a real little uh, uh, short breath. You actually have to, you know, take in a deep breath and exhale pretty hard because <clears throat> what that does is it, it captures the uh, air from the base of your of your lungs in those air sacs where this alcohol vapor has collected. So in essence, that's how a blood alcohol or a, um, a breath test for blood alcohol uh, works. <clears throat> uh, another important property, uh, alcohol is very soluble in water. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> the chemical formula for alcohol is C2 H5OH. <clears throat> so uh, what we find, the molecules that we find in ethyl alcohol that we drink, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and hydroxide. Hydroxide is uh, a combination of an atom of oxygen and uh, hydrogen. Uh, interestingly enough, the chemical formula for water is H2. O. And if you take a look, we have commonalities in the molecular structure of ethanol, alcohol, and water. Um, simply put, what, what this means is um, that, that these two chemical formulas, they like each other. And alcohol mixes very well with water. Uh, so in other words, it's very soluble in water. <clears throat> if we were to take um, an empty container and fill this uh, halfway with vegetable oil, then fill it the rest of the way with pure ethanol alcohol, and we would shake it up and agitate it and then let it sit, uh, I think you probably have a good idea of, of uh, what would happen. The alcohol and the oil would actually separate. And, and that's because uh, alcohol is not very soluble in fat. It doesn't mix well with fat. Uh, if we put this half with water, half with ethanol, ac and agitated it, what would happen is <clears throat> these two chemicals and their molecular formulas, they would merge uh, together very, very nicely. And you would find that instead of the alcohol being up on the top and the fat being on the bottom, you would have alcohol <clears throat> that would be infused throughout all of the liquid. Um, so what does that mean in terms of the human body? Uh, that means that alcohol uh, is very, very friendly with the human body. Uh, and that's because a very high percentage of the human body contains water. So uh, alcohol is going to pass into tissues and cells um, uh, that have a relatively high concentration of water. And uh, that's a lot of tissue and cells throughout the body. Alcohol is not going to find its way into your body fat uh, because it doesn't mix well with fat. Uh, it's not going to get absorbed into your bone, uh, bones either. 
so what you'll find is that when people drink alcohol, it gets distributed throughout the liquid, the water, and the tissues and the cells that have water in them. Um, <clears throat> blood obviously is uh, um, a liquid, contains water, and uh, alcohol gets into the bloodstream very easily, mixes with the bloodstream, and gets transported around uh, the body very, very easily. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the effects of uh, body mass and body fat uh, on blood alcohol concentration in a little bit. And, and because alcohol is not very fat soluble, uh, that's the reason why uh, people who have a higher concentration of body fat than someone else who weighs the same amount, they're going to have um, a slightly higher blood alcohol concentration because there isn't as much body tissue for the alcohol to be absorbed in uh, because they have more body fat. Uh, another property of uh, alcohol is that it has calories and no nutrients. Uh, so you can gain weight drinking uh, alcohol. Uh, you're going to take in uh, calories. Your body can burn uh, C2H, 5OH, or ethanol uh, as a source of energy. Uh, but but <clears throat> this chemical has no nutrients. There are no carbohydrates or, or protein uh, in ethanol. Now, if you look at a, a can of beer, for example, you might see um, uh, an amount of carbohydrate that's indicated in there. That carbohydrate is not coming from the alcohol. That carbohydrate is actually coming from the barley and the hops that was used to ferment the liquid that was uh, used to produce the ethanol. So you can, you can get for, for an ounce of ethanol, and remember when we talked about a standard drink, standard drink has a little over half an ounce of ethanol. So uh, an ounce of ethanol has about 210 calories. So if you, if you drink two drinks, as we define standard drink, um, you're going to be taking in a little bit over, obviously a little bit above 210 calories for those two drinks. So you can gain weight uh, by drinking alcohol. 